Welcome to today's video. Um, today we're going to be talking about HTTP or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, what this is is the kind of the core mechanism in which our applications, our browsers are able to request the web pages from the websites. Uh, it's, it's what we use every single day that we navigate the web. Um, it's something that, it's one of those fundamental topics that give you a much deeper, richer, and, and broader understanding of how web applications work. And while we won't necessarily be using, um, you know, the, the HTTP protocol directly in our application development through most of the semester, it is something that's really important to understand as someone who's going to do application development. Um, it is also something very important to understand if at any point in your career um, that you start looking more at the security model of the web uh, because it is one of those underlying features or mechanisms that, that, there, that has vulnerabilities and weaknesses within it. Um, so today we'll talk about that uh, relatively short lecture here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the what what are the underlying pieces, and we've started working with that with our LAMP stack. We have an operating system, we have some software that uh, is running our web server that's listening on a particular port, um, and then we have our ability to connect to that because it's made publicly available over the internet, or um, or I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be if it's an internet-based application. Regardless, a client has to be able to connect to that. Um, talked a little bit about web servers already. We've spent some time working with Apache unless you've decided to go and use or explore excuse me, um, a different uh, a different software like Nginx or IIS, uh, which I encourage you to do, but not to the point you get distracted on the course. Well, this is an intense course and in that we're, we're going to cover 16 weeks worth of material in six weeks. Um, web servers are simply software. They're complex pieces of software, but they're simply software that runs as a service on a machine and listens on a specific port. Um, every machine has 65,000 and some odd ports available to listen on. And every machine, there are kind of a handful of those um, that are reserved for specific reasons. Uh, SSH, FTP, mail, SMTP, uh, web. And web has a particular port, port 80 and port 443. Um, which we saw a little bit of that when we when I did our configuration. Um, again, it's not critical to understand that for the purposes of the course, because we're going to focus more on applications. So this is just filling in some of those background pieces. And again, something that if you're going to do this deeper or, or get more into this kind of development, I think you're going to want to spend some time learning. Um, that web server then, that operating system that contains that web server, that machine that contains that web server, um, hosts the application and the code. And then together they execute the code. Um, this ties into then a request response cycle. And what we use is HTTP uh, through our browsers to determine, to send a request to a server so that it can find the resource, the page that we're requesting and send that response back. Um, typically applications, websites are going to have a folder that they store all the sites in, all of the applications in. And we saw that with our LAMP stack. Uh, and then our Linux machines, most of us probably had a folder structure of slash forward slash var forward slash www forward slash sites. This can be subject to change based off of the, um, the version of Apache, the type of web server you're using, the operating system, etc. Um, with Internet Information Services, this is Microsoft's uh, web server, it's going to be in a location like this. Uh, so the root of your C drive, typically the root of your C drive, inet pub, www root. Um, security conscious people will oftentimes move these locations around and they'll put them on a different drive or in a different share or something. But again, a little beyond what we need to talk about here. Um, what is a web application? And hopefully you've seen a little bit of insight into that in, in going through the process of setting up WordPress and setting up Drupal. And that websites are simply a collection of files and folders, resources that we that our clients request using their browsers. Um, when we have the document root of our website, most of the time we'll have a lot of websites inside of there. Um, most people that get hosting, you know, let's say you go through DreamHost or GoDaddy or wherever you'd like to go, um, you're, you're oftentimes going to be in a shared hosting environment. That means that you're going to be in that document root of that web server with a lot of other applications. Uh, this is an example of off of my machine, um, off of my MacBook anyway. Uh, I have Apache running. I have the document root set to this location, this folder here called sites that I have favorited in my, in my finder window. Um, and then I have multiple applications that live inside of that folder. Each one of these applications represent, or each one of these folders represent a different application, a different collection of files and folders and resources and connections to the database and everything. They're standalone, uh, standalone applications. Um, in, in a production environment, we would set these up so that, that no application could get access to another application. Right? But again, that's more of a security concern. And so I want to mention those here as we go, but it's not necessarily the focus of the course. 
So we have the server component that listens for requests, that executes code on the server, that dynamic side. We're going to talk about two different places where the code is executed, client side, which is going to be our JavaScript, and server side, which is going to be things like PHP and, um, and even .NET and Ruby and some of those others. We'll focus predominantly on PHP, though. Um, the other component, then, is how does the user request the resource? How does the user request that page from the server? Well, we use browsers, and there are a lot of browsers out there. Safari, Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, um, uh, the boy, there was another one, a newer one. Um, if you remember Opera, Opera's been kind of, uh, I guess, kind of dormant for a while. Um, Vivaldi has, has kind of emerged as a fork off of that project. And so a lot of browsers out there. Um, you can go to this URL, github.com. You can find the source code for the Chromium project. Um, and so and these are just the dominant ones. You know, We have built-in browsers for Android and iOS. iOS uses Safari. We have browsers in our TVs. Um, I mean, browsers all over the place. And what this causes, as, as a web developer, this causes us a, a great deal of problems because each one of these browsers then has the ability to determine how it understands JavaScript and how it understands um, the HTML and the CSS a little bit differently. And so that's why we have trouble. If you've ever gone to a site and said, well, this, this looks good in Firefox, but it doesn't look so good in Chrome, well, that's probably not realistic. A more realistic example would be, well, this looks pretty good in Firefox or Chrome, and it doesn't look so good in Internet Explorer, is because each browser can do whatever they want. Right. We have standards out there. Uh, the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, um, tries to, or it does, put out a, a body of standards for everybody to understand, but not everybody. They, they don't have any way to enforce that. And so while they're out there and they exist, um, the browser developers, the browser vendors, are free to do whatever they want. Um, this results in fragmentation, and it is a problem from a developer perspective because we, and we'll talk about this later in the course, we have to do browser testing. We have to develop our sites, we have to make sure that they look good, that the layout's good, that the CSS is right, that the JavaScript works the way we intend them um, in order to ensure that every, or at least the vast majority of our users have the same experience regardless of how they access our site. Right? So that's one of the unique challenges in being in, in the web development spectrum or sphere is that you don't control how your user interface, your UI, uh, is necessarily implemented by that browser. Right. The other important part of it is that it initiates the request for a web page. And what it, how it does that is through kind of underlying, under the hood, is that HTTP request, which we'll talk about here in a second. So we need a URL. We need to figure out what we're requesting. We typically call that, or I'll, you'll typically hear me refer to that as a resource. Um, the browser is requesting a resource. That is a page. That is a style sheet. That is a JavaScript file. That is an image. Those are all resources available on the web server. Our client has to make the request for those. Um, and as I mentioned, HTTP is a request response model. So client-server relationship. Right? We, we've talked a little bit about that already, and that our clients, our browsers are that, are that client, and that server is the server. And the client makes a re request to the server, the server sends a response. And we just repeat this over and over again as we're interacting with that application. Um, typically this is the browser. Typically this browser exists within a device, within an operating system, or something that you install. But anything that can make an HTTP request can ultimately interact with those with the web server. And uh, I'll show you just a real brief demo here as we get to the end. Um, what do we connect to the service to do? Well, we request resources, we post information, we get information, we query data. We'll talk a little bit more about APIs. Um, and you know, how do you embed your Twitter feed on your website? Well, you 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 interact with using HTTP. You interact with Twitter's API. You say, give me the top five or the latest five tweets for this user account, and it returns those, and then you show those on your web pages. And so it gives us a great model um, for through this client-server relationship to just exchange information and data. So as I mentioned, HTTP stands for the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, one of the problems that uh, developed, because if you if you dig back into the history of the internet, um, it was never intended to be or to house rich applications. Applications that care about state, that is, applications that care about who we are as users. I go to Amazon. I need to log in on Amazon, and I want Amazon to know who I am. I have a profile. I have orders. I have a shopping cart. If Amazon can't do that, then the, the internet doesn't exist, right? It, it, it's just a, as it was an originally designed, a way to deliver static content. And uh, obviously it's gone beyond that. Um, 
it's a connectionless stateless protocol and that is there are things that have to happen behind the hood or under the hood of our browsers and these applications in order to figure out and maintain and track who's who. Um, that gets a little bit deeper into something called session, well, there's three primary topics there, uh, authentication, session management, um, and then access controls and we're not, we're not going to get too deep into that. Um, we're just get, trying to introduce this concept and so um, HTTP helps us through some of the other headers and mechanisms here that we'll talk about a little bit here um, uh, in order to maintain that state. Uh, the primary method for doing that is cookies and we'll talk later on this semester about how do we store data for our websites on the client side. On the server side it's pretty easy. We have, we have uh, databases predominantly to do that but on the client side we have fewer options. We do have databases now um, but we have cookies and those cookies and these session values that we create, that our applications create, uh, allow us to maintain that statefulness. That is, someone can go to a website and we can keep track of who they are. Um, as I mentioned, everybody has a browser. Refrigerators have browsers, smart TVs, everybody has a browser. Um, but they're not just browsers anymore. They've really become the new thick client. Uh, that is, that you, you look at anybody's desktop and um, you know we don't have a bunch of applications installed like we used to depending on your age I guess um, I used to have a lot of applications installed now I have a browser open or multiple browser windows open each with multiple tabs I, pr I pretty much can do everything um, through very robust very dynamic uh, web applications um, mobile apps a lot of mobile apps are just websites that are wrapped. They're wrapped in something using PhoneGap or Cordova. They're hybrid. And so you download them through the App Store, you launch them as the icon from your desktop on your mobile device, your smart device. Um, but all they're doing is, is launching a browser without any Chrome, without any features, without, without the back button and the forward button and the URL bar. Um, and so we'll talk about those as well as we get a little bit further on in the semester. All right, so it's a cycle of requests. Uh, client requests a resource. We have two different types of requests, um, get and post. Get, get requests retrieve information and post requests submit information. And uh, we'll see those a little bit more in depth as we get to that portion in the semester where we talk about submitting input. Um, we send headers. Uh, cookies are always sent. Um, the refer header is the last page visited. Um, and then so the client initiates this, this request and we use we have all these HTTP headers um, that are sent as part of that request we have to identify what we want who we are where are we coming from are there any cookie values that we need to send um, and we'll take a look at this as an example here in just a minute um, we send all that information to the server the server captures that or receives that HTTP request and then it determines what to send back um, it also sends back with it additional headers Here's the status of your request, here's some information, and then here's the actual HTML itself. Right? And so this process, all this is saying is that HTTP is a mechanism for clients to request a resource and the resource, the server, to send that resource back. Right? So we can take a look at that. Um, you'll notice that uh, I use Firefox. This is a developer edition of Firefox that I'm trying out, and so it should look pretty similar to um, you know, if you're using Firefox or Chrome or something, because we'll, we'll use the developer tools here. Uh, I'm going to go to usd.edu, and um, what we can do is we can right-click and inspect element. And so we're going to use these developer tools extensively throughout the course. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and if as you, as uh, a web developer, you're going to want to get very familiar with these tools because these are, are very, very valuable when it comes to building applications. Um, so once you open your developer tools, multiple tabs here. Uh, for right now, we want to focus on the network tab. And if you um, hold shift and refresh your page, what that does is that eliminates any caching. And so this will give us a fresh copy of the page without any caching. And we'll talk, uh, we might not talk about caching much, probably not. Um, Anyway, so these are all the requests. These are all the HTTP requests that this site made, um, th that our browser made on behalf of this website. All we did was go to usd.edu. Um, you can see here that on the bottom we have the ability to filter based off of the type of request, the type of resource, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, fonts, images, uh, XHR, I'm not even sure what that is. <laughs> Images, media, flash, whatever. Um, if we just say all, then these are all the requests. Each of these required an, individ an individual HTTP request and response. Um, for USD's homepage then, we had a total of 58 total requests. And it looks like about five, uh, 5,000 kilobytes or five megs downloaded. Right? Well, that's a lot of requests, considering that you only initiated one from your browser, going to usd.edu. 
Um, everything generates a request. Pages, uh, images, um, fonts, everything generates a request, right? And so that's, it's very important to understand that or start to begin to understand that because um, how we structure our pages, if we have, and, and, and goodness, go to a news site here. Let's go to CNN.com. Uh, I like to pick on news sites because they're really bad about this. We'll do an inspect element. We'll go to the network tab. And you can see it's still loading. And, I'm, and I've got this page, there's caching going on here, I believe, as well. Right, 150, 160, <laughs> or already over 200 pages, and it's still loading. Uh, I've been on this page for quite a while now, and it's still making requests, it's still loading content. Right, This hinders the performance of this page because of all these requests that are going on. Um, almost 400, okay, yeah, we've got to move on. We'll come back to it later because uh, we're at at least over 400 requests already. Um, so thankfully, DS, or USD does not have uh, that same number of requests. Um, you want to look at the headers? Okay, so status codes, we'll talk about status codes in a little bit. 200 is a good code because it means that the server found what we were looking for. Um, we can select any of these and you can see request headers and response headers. Right? And again, we're not going to get too deep into these headers in the course. I just simply want to show them to you so that you know that they exist, so that you know underlying this is how our, our browsers are making requests for uh, these web pages. Right, so some pretty common ones, the host header, the user agent, this is what leaks a little bit of information about who you are, um, cookies, cookies and cookies values, and we'll talk about those a little bit more uh, as we get into storage. Um, cache directives, I said that when I when you hold fresh, uh, shift and hit refresh, that'll tell the browser to not use any caching, and that's how it does that. It adds these headers so that everything that, that processes this request doesn't use the header, concludes the browser. Um, this is the response from the server itself. And so we have the request headers and the response headers. And then, of course, the actual content. Um, so looking at an image, we would see that it had, um, let's see, the response itself would be this image. Right? So we got those headers as well as the actual image that was requested through this, this HTTP request. All right, let's go back and check on CNN, see if it's finally done. <laughs> My goodness, it's still going. Um, we're at 1,400 requests, uh, so uh, I'm going to give up on that, and I'm probably never going to go to CNN again. Um, all right, so that's kind of the, the basics there, and you can see that in the browser. You can use your developer tools, and you can go to any website that you want and, uh, uh, and, and watch this interaction happening. Okay, I just mentioned the response codes, and response codes are important because they tell us about the the the, this, the, the server's way of telling us a little bit about what we just requested. Two hundreds are good. It means request received and response sent, and we saw that in that browser. Most of our responses were two hundred. That is that we got a response back, which is good. It means everything's functioning normally. Um, 300s are redirects, and you, you probably get these more than you realize. You just don't, it just happens so quickly. That's, that is that you requested a resource, but the server said it's actually located somewhere else, so it redirects you somewhere else. Um, when you log in, oftentimes that happens. You log in to a site, and then they redirect you to your homepage or your dashboard or whatever it is. Um, Inevitably, you run across a 404, you click a link that knows that it's no longer linking to active content, or you type in a URL wrong, um, you get that 404 error. That says, well, the, that re requested resource was not found. And uh, I'll just real quick try to generate one of those at USD. I'm pretty sure if I just type in my name, I'm going to generate a 404, but there we go. See, get 404. All right, so it didn't return a status code for us based off of the way that the server is set up, but it did, you can see here, there is the 404 error. Um, let's see if I can... This is slow. Um, yeah, see, but you get information, and the idea here is it is a 404. 404 error indicates that that resource was not found. Um, 500s are server errors. And those become more important when you start doing dynamic or the server side coding. Um, working with PHP, if you have a syntax error in your code, um, if you like when you try to compile a Java app, uh, if you generate a syntax error, it doesn't compile. It's the same thing here. But the server, um, because you don't, it's PHP is interpreted, it's not compiled necessarily, um, it generates a 503 error. So that means something went wrong on the server, you have a problem with your code, and you need to get in there and figure out what the problem is. 
Um, there's some underlying protocols, and these aren't as, as important because uh, you probably haven't heard of them or haven't been exposed to them before. TCP and UDP, and um, we use we use predominantly use TCP for d delivery. That's the network layer protocol. Uh, TCP is good for normal interaction. It's transmission control protocol. It's how the packets. Um, it's how the data the data goes, including the HTTP request, goes from our machine across networks to the actual server and back. Um, TCP is more reliable and that it ensures delivery of the packets. It takes a request and it chops it up into you know a set amount of bytes and then it sends it over the network. Um, UDP doesn't and what we use UDP for um, is for streaming video and VoIP and things. Um, TCP is not good. An example would be when you're streaming content. Um, you know, you're looking at a video on YouTube or something and uh, you get audio but you get no video or you get video but you got little blocks and squares or chunks in it all over the place. Um, you're losing packets and because UDP doesn't ensure the delivery of those, the video just keeps on going. You just lose that content for that particular period of time. And so normally the experience is fine. You, I mean, it, it may suffer quality-wise, but you normally can still hear and you can normally still see. Um, but it's because of UDP that does that. TCP is more reliable. We need that for things like commerce because we need to make sure that all of the packets, all of the information is delivered between the client and the server and the server and the client. Okay, um, TLS, SSL, uh, we won't talk a whole lot about this, but again, it's something that's very critical to understand as you start developing applications further in your career. Um, this is what ensures or encrypts the communication, secures the communication between the client and the server and back. And so um, this is oftentimes, you'll see this when you go to a site and you'll go HTTPS. And I don't know if USD has a secure, let's find out. All right, 2,600 requests. So I'm, something must be wrong here. I'm just going to go ahead and close that because that's very abnormal. Um, let's see. We'll see if that works. We'll come back to it. Uh, but the, the S in the HTTPS, that means it's using uh, encryption. And so the communication between your browser and that server is protected. It's encrypted. Um, that's important. If you're doing anything sensitive, if you're logging in and you're, and you're using your password, you're, you're processing credit card information, you need to make sure that that session is encrypted. If it's not... Um, then you've got a problem. People can sniff that data and steal it, and that would be a bad, a very bad thing. Right? So um, again, it's a little bit beyond what we need to cover for this course because we're just going to focus on development of the application. But I want you to make sure that you tuck this away somewhere in the back of your of your, of your mind, um, so that again, if you go further on, these are things you need to be aware of. You cannot develop applications that do something sensitive and not have SSL or TLS implemented correctly. Um, the Heartbleed bug, uh, this is a very kind of security-centric issue. Um, again, you may or may not have heard about it. Uh, and so I just leave this in here that for those that are interested to um, to do a search for it, it's a, it's a year or so old now that this vulnerability came out, but it was a problem within SSL or, or the SSL libraries, SSL TLS. And so you can read through here. This is a pretty good description on what happened. Um, and then there's some information as well as a lot of videos. I've got some videos available on my YouTube channel if you'd like to know more about it. Right. Um, here's our typical topology then. To kind of summarize everything that we've been talking about, here's our browser, here's our server. We initiate a request, um, we send a response back. The server sends a response back. We initiate a request, the server, before it can send a response back, has to talk to a database server or some sort of other search providing. Maybe it's connecting to an API to make uh, you know, a purchase an order or connect to Facebook or, or YouTube or Twitter or something. Um, it's doing a lot of things before it's sending our response back. Um, don't worry about what happens here because uh, that's just more of a security focus. I meant to delete that, so I apologize for not doing that. Um, uh, you, we can't intercept that. that. I mean, that's the point of it, is that people can intercept our communication. And so if we're not protecting it with SSL or TLS, it's, it can be tampered with. Um, but that's beyond what we're going to talk about. Again, I want you to be aware of the security, but we don't need to, we're not going to focus on it. Right? So this is overall the model. Here's our client. Here's our server. As far as our client is concerned, it's a request response cycle. Okay, um, users can submit arbitrary input, and that is one another thing that we're not going to focus on. So I wanted to make sure that we talked about it at least for a minute here. Um, is that from the client side, users can send anything they want to the application because of this HTTP request response cycle. Um, 
users can send anything they want to the application. And so it's very, it's we have to be careful about that when we're determining what we allow users to send to the application, what kind of a functionality we expose to them. Um, and so just always, you know, again, keep, this is another one of those issues to keep in the back of your head, um, you know, user input. If users can supply any kind of input, you know, what is your application doing to protect that or to determine whether or not that is valid input? Um, and again, there's a lot of courses out there that will take you deeper into the security aspect of that. And I would encourage you uh, to pursue those if you want to take on application software web development uh, as a career. Okay. Um, the last thing that we'll look at, and this is that little demo, and uh, I don't know if this was, if this anyone will enjoy this or not, but just to show you that there, there are more. We can do more than just uh, browsers. We we can initiate HTTP requests with more than just browsers. Um, this is not something you have to set up. Uh, if you, again, if you're interested in something like this, uh, I'm not going to go through the setup. You can email me, and I will, I will help you get this set up. Um, but uh, I have a little terminal. It's Sigwin. I like to use Sigwin. It gives me a Linux-like terminal in my Windows machine. Um, and so we can run Python. Python is a very popular language. Um, and we can in initiate if we just if you just simply copy that code down. So import URL of two. Um, we can initiate an HTTP request response from a script like this. And so um, just to show you that not everything, not all HTTP requests have to initiate or come from the from the browser. Okay, there we go. Read the response, and now we'll print that response. And what you're going to see here is there's the HTML, right? Script divs body HTML. That's that's the home page from USD's website. Uh, it's the bottom of it. We'd have to scroll all the way up to the top, right? This is all that HTML. The browser is what makes sense of this. Uh, in this case, because we requested this not through a browser, we just got the raw response. That is the HTTP response. Uh, there's some Google Analytics, there's the tracker code, so you know that anytime you're on USD's website, they're using Google to track what you do. Um, and that's it. All right, so that's all I have. Uh, hopefully that was uh, kind of enlightening in how HTTP works. Again, um, not a deep dive. That was just, I meant that to be an introduction so that you have a basic understanding of, of some of these underlying protocols and mechanisms that make our applications work. Our focus is development. So um, let me know if you have any questions, concerns, comments about that. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys in the next video. Thanks.